Turn your King James Bible to Psalm 9. I'm going to talk today about where is hell located. This is a fairly easy study in terms of understanding that it's in the heart of the earth. I've talked about it many times, but there's a lot of things that tie into this study which are pretty strong meat. That's what we'll be getting into in this study. Psalm 9, uh, verse 15 through 20. It says here, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid is their own foot taken. Kind of funny, in the net which they uh, hid, you know, like the internet. Nothing to it there. There's a lot of sin on the internet, in other words. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion Silah. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Coming soon to America. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Uh, those last two verses there, I have a little a notepad thing I carry around if I need to write notes. And um, it's with me all the time. And I have Psalm 9, verse 19 through 20 in the back. And I open up sometimes and I just pray that. This nation needs to be judged. The heathen need to be judged. Why? Put them in fear, O Lord, that, they may, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Um, there needs to be some fear brought to this nation. Um, people have become so wicked and so vile. Uh, you know, oh, we, we don't want, you know, war. I hope war doesn't happen. Oh, I hope that there's no war or bad times. But yet you watch movies about war. You watch movies about killing and TV shows about killing people and play video games murdering people. But you don't want the reality of it. Yeah. Um, you know why there's so much corruption and evil? Because people don't want to shed their own blood. Men in the past would have taken up arms long ago. Long ago. <laughs> but now, well, I have my job and I have this you know, mortgage I'm trying to pay off and all this other stuff. And, mm -hmm. Nobody's willing to shed their blood to make this nation righteous again. Uh, there's a saying, you know, that uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. A lot of truth to that. That's a historical documented fact. I'm not saying, you know, let's go kill people. Or something. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that that's what happens occasionally. Tyrants get too bad. Patriots have to stand up. And the patriots don't get to shed all the blood of tyrants and none of their own. No, there's both. Tyranny is something that uh, destroys a nation. But you see there, all the nations uh, that forget God are turned into hell. Where is hell? Acts chapter 2. Go to the New Testament now. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we'll find the exact location of hell according to the King James Bible. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 22 through 27. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Notice the Lord knew that it was going to happen. The uh, determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, it was part of his plan, but they still get blamed for it. The nation of Israel. He came to his own and his own received him not. You see? You see how it works with God? Everybody out there, God knows who's going to heaven, who's going to hell because he can see into the future. But it's up to them to make that decision. They have free will to accept or reject the gospel. And so, well, I just don't see why a loving God would send anybody to hell. He knows who's going to hell. Yeah, but you see, it's your decision. You are the one that puts yourself in hell. Why did you reject the Bible? I can't believe that as it's written. It's a, all translations are filled with copyist errors and what. Then go to hell, according to your decision. By thy words thou shalt be justified. By thy words thou shalt be condemned. <clears throat> Verse twenty four, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Um, don't fall for the thing that the earth uh, 
is not moved or whatever else. That's not true. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. All right? The soul of the Godhead went down to hell. You say, well, how do you know it's down? We'll prove it in this study. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 38 through 40. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he, but he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, in there, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I will not leave my soul in hell three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's down in the heart of the earth. So how do you know it's down? Let's continue. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Go back there to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32 verse 19 is where we're going to go. We read here, And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with them, or with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will, pro I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation prophecy for today basically the lord's going to the gentiles and he's forsaking the jews for a time but it comes back for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains hmm interesting the lowest hell go to uh job chapter 26 Job chapter 26. I'm going to be hitting a lot of scripture references today, so I'm going to try to keep this going. Job 26 verse 5. And here we get into some very deep things. Job 26 verse 5. Dead things are formed from under the waters, and the inhabitants thereof. Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. Um, he holdeth back the face of his throne, and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo! These are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? Let me say that one more time. The thunder of his power, who can understand? You know what God is trying to tell Job in that area there? Well, not here, but he gets into the, you know, later on. Um, God basically has to abase his pride because Job's trying to figure out God. He's trying to understand things about the Lord and whatever else. Um, the fact of the matter is, you read through that passage there, not one of you out there can tell me what that means. And I can't tell you what it means. The exact thing of how that's all interpreted, it's too high for me. It's just way up there and I say, okay, I don't know. I trust the Bible. I trust what it says. But uh, we'll keep going about this whole thing of hell and the location of it. No, I can, I, I have, you know, some drawings and things, you know. Um, I believe that the Bible, you know, plainly teaches this, and I'm going to draw out what the earth looks like. You're an arrogant uh, child if you can know exactly what the earth looks like. Uh, nobody does. You get right down to it. We don't know what the earth looks like. 
Psalm 16. I mean, I can say I know it's a sphere. I know that. Um, it's not flat. It's not, uh, you know, some kind of uh, whatever. But in terms of knowing exactly what it looks like and everything, no, I, I don't know. What's it mean? He, he hung the earth upon nothing. Well, that kind of looks like what you would see with the depiction of the planets out there in outer space. They, they're hanging upon nothing. They're just there. Uh, being held by God's power, I would say. Oh no, there's a dark matter and dark energy and there's all this special stuff and astrophysics. and all. You don't have a clue. Okay, you don't know. You know the man comes up with all these little scientific ways to explain what's already there. But how did it get there? Well, we have to guess at that. I'll just believe the Bible. Oh, well, you're just some kind of an ignoramus. You don't really know it. Well, then I'll be an ignoramus. Um, Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I believe that. I don't have to see everything about heaven and whatever else. I just what the Bible says, I believe it. But again, we see that prophecy there that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. His soul was not left in hell, and his flesh did not see corruption. Um, go to Psalm 55. Now we're going to start to see some of the stuff about the direction of where hell is located. Uh, well, maybe the heart of the earth is sort of a, a you know, levitating you know, thing that's up in the air and that's where hell's at or something. No, hell is down. Um, Psalm 55, verse 9 through 15. Um, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Not happening anymore. It's just back in the Old Testament. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a little bit of violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. Amen. The modern cities are insane stuff that goes on. Verse 12. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked in under the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them let, and let them go down quick into hell. Down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Let them go down quick into hell. Hmm. So what direction is the heart of the earth? Down. It's not up somewhere floating around or off to the side or, you know, the earth is a flat plane and there's a, the middle of it, there's kind of this place that the government protects or something and that's where you can't get to and that's where the heart of the earth is. No, it's down. Okay, and I realize that the, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, the flat earthers believe it's some kind of a, this, you know, footstool looking thing or something. They Again, they take, they don't understand what the, you know, God's not putting his feet up on the earth, okay? Um, heaven is my throne. What, all of heaven? Uh, no, they don't quite get that, you know, thing there. They twist the scriptures like crazy. That's why I don't waste my time too much on this flat earth stuff. And, well, you haven't really studied. Oh, I've watched quite a few videos and I've read quite a few articles. But I just look at it and I say, mm, yeah, it's not really worth my time to go into this. Every little explanation of every little thing. And, of course, that makes them think that they've won. And, like I've said, you know, go ahead, whatever. You want to claim victory and... Denlinger's an idiot. Okay, don't watch me anymore. Unsubscribe. Go away. Um, whatever. But um, I've seen the pictures and they have this little thing of where it goes down and there's Sheol down there, you know, whatever. And that's where the heart of the earth is, apparently. Uh, no, that doesn't work. And we'll, I'll show you the reasons why. Uh, go to Proverbs 7. Proverbs chapter 7. I'm going to show you some really neat things here later on, too, how things work out. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. 
Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. It's talking about a prostitute, this whorish woman here, talking about her house is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. All right, going down to the chambers of death. Where is hell? Below your feet. You say, oh, well, wait a second. If the flat earth is true, then is it below everybody's feet? Well, apparently not. It would just be kind of in the middle, in the heart of the earth there. Uh, then how would that verse be true for everybody? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I'll show you a little illustration here. We'll talk more about this as time goes by. This one I used, my son's little ball from when he was a baby. Um, I used this back in my video I did about the, the four corners of the earth. Is the, does the Bible teach a flat earth? And I said no back then, and I still say no today uh, for we, reasons which I've already come out with. But you see, if this, if the, this is kind of like what the earth looks like, then the center, the heart of this, which I can't get to, I'm not going to cut it in half, but the center of this thing would be below everybody that's on that entire earth. Everybody, wherever they're at, down would be towards the center of the earth. So it'd be true for everybody. Going down into hell. But if it's a flat plane, then the Bible lies. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. I believe the book. I don't believe uh, flat earthers. Um, Proverbs 15, verse 24. Let's go there next. Proverbs 15, verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. Okay, again, if that's, if this flat earth thing is true, and then you got the little Sheol thing right there in the middle, then what about the people that live out on the borders of that? That They're not standing above the heart of the earth, where hell is, you see? Uh, no, it's true for everybody. This isn't just written to the people that were directly above hell or something. Uh, that's nonsense. Um, Isaiah 5. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 5, um, verse 8. And, you know, I just want to make a point here, too. The thing, oh, you're, you're causing strife by this, Brian. No, see, here's how it works. Somebody comes along with a false doctrine. I have to attack that false doctrine. And it's going to create strife, unfortunately, because I'm attacking something that's false. They fight back. The Pharisees come to Jesus. They came to him, and they were saying things to him, and the Lord had to fight back. And he said, well, then there's fighting there. There's strife. There's contention. Jesus brought contention. No, they came with something false and the Lord had to rebuke them sharply. People come to me with the flat earth thing and I have to rebuke them sharply. And it creates strife. It can creates contention. Right? But I'm not the one bringing it. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Well, you just be quiet about it. I was. I have been quiet for many years. Over six years, I just kept my mouth shut about this stupid heresy of the flat earth thing. And just kind of, oh, people can believe what they want to believe. Yeah, and it's getting worse as time goes by. A lot more people are falling for it. It's ridiculous. Isaiah 5, verse 8 through 16. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Um, it doesn't say too much for the cities either that we just read about back there in Psalm. Um, you should get out and have some uh, nature around you. It's the best way to live. In mine ears saith, or said the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until uh, night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe, and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. The vast majority of people in this heathen nation of America and most of the people out there that are watching me, they don't even think about God. But look at verse 14. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. 
and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth, rejoiceth shall descend into it. Uh, see where I'm reading to, verse 18. No. Okay, verse 16. Looking at my notes here. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the, lo of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. You exalt God when he judges the earth. Oh, it's an act of God. Yeah, it's called he's judging the earth. But very important here. Verse 14. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. You know, again, using the ball here as a, as a way to illustrate this thing. Let me just turn the page here on my notes. But using this ball, again, I can't do this, but imagine if this thing could open its mouth, you know, like this. I'll just use my hands kind of a thing, you know, like that, and opens its mouth to swallow up more victims, more people going in there. Victims of their own self-righteousness, victims of their own sin. That's what they're victims of. They're not victims of God that God you know, did some horrible thing to them. No, they deserve hell. They're going down in there. But again, how do you get the flat land to open its mouth? How does that work? This sphere, this ball, it can, hell is, anybody where, wherever this ball is, hell's beneath them. You know, I used to make these little tracks, little business card tracks, and had a little arrow pointing down that said hell locator. And then, you know, I gave the scriptures that hell's in the heart of the earth. And I said, you know, here's a website. Go to this website. I'll tell you how to get saved. It wasn't even my website. Um, but I used to make those things. I'd put them all over the place, these little business card tracks. But I knew way back then, that was before King James Video Ministries even got started. And I, um, it might have been early, I think, when it was first getting started, 2007 or so. But uh, I knew that hell was down below that way. You know, and you'll see lost people. They know. They understand. You know, they say, oh, you're going up to heaven. Oh, I'm probably going more down that way. They know. It's down there under their feet. They understand that they're on a ball, on a sphere. Now, you know, you can debate whether it's moving or not, back and forth, geocentricity or heliocentricity, that the sun is the, the center of the universe, and people, oh, that's satanic. and Whatever. Okay. Whatever you're going to believe there, do the study, do whatever. I'm not going to waste much time on that, to be very honest with you. It doesn't really matter to me. But um, because, you know, well, there's verses in, in the scriptures that talk about it doesn't move. There's geocentricity. I've already debunked that. It's just a English idiom, meaning the purpose of the earth is not going to be changed. It shall not be moved. Nobody's going to move me from how I feel about my wife. Nobody's going to convince me otherwise. Nobody's going to be moving me away from the King James Bible. That's what it's talking about. And if you want to say that it's, no, it proves geocentricity, if you haven't watched the study, um, no, it does not pre pre prove geocentricity that the earth shall not be moved because the righteous shall not be moved. We already went over a couple of those verses. So we don't have righteous centricity. You know, um, well, the sun, uh, you know, it, uh, Joshua said that the, prayed in the, you know, for the sun to stop and it stopped. Therefore, that proves that the earth doesn't move. It proves that the, earth, the sun moves. Well, it would look that way, and maybe that's true. I don't know. But, you know, um, how do you know what God did? Aren't you making some assumptions of God said, okay, stop the sun from going around? Couldn't he have stopped the earth? And Joshua was looking and saying, hey, the sun stopped. You know, you aren't going to feel the earth. The earth is a huge planet. You aren't going to feel it all of a sudden, You know, oh, it's moving at 1,000 miles an hour or something. Wow, we have to run, you know, to keep up with it or something. Like a little hamster on a, on a ball or whatever. No, you don't feel the movement of the earth, right? So Joshua is the one that's recording it, and he's saying, yeah, I asked the Lord to stop the sun, and he stopped it. It's right there. It's not, it's not going down anymore. It's his perception of the thing. So, but, you know, fight back and forth over the shape of the earth, and if it's moving or not, or whatever. It gets ridiculous after a while. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I mean, you know, the economy is about ready to fall apart. We're going into World War III. You get Christians fighting over the shape of the earth and whether it moves or not. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Roman Catholic uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall 
radical trad cat, traditional Catholic, and he wants to run for president. Hello? <laughs> Wake up! You don't want a traditional Catholic running America. Okay, you want to go to a camp and be tortured? You want to be burned at the stake? Have you remembered about the Inquisition? Well, let's fight each other on the shape of the earth. Genesis chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, Why hast thou done, or what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And look at this, this is interesting. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Ah. Uh, when thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Hmm. Kind of an interesting thing there. Uh, when thou tellest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Uh, that's, you know, a lot of the modern agricultural type of stuff, the GMO crops and everything else. Uh, they have to do all sorts of things to make the crops grow better and whatever because they don't yield the strength that God could give them if they were righteous. But it's interesting there that the earth opens her mouth and receives the blood there. Hmm. The blood cries out to God in heaven. I wonder how much uh, blood has been absorbed by the earth. I'm sorry to be a little bit graphic here. Very sorry, but uh, all those little dead babies that this wicked satanic country has aborted. Here in Maine, they just passed a, a what late-term abortion or something like this. That satanic witch down there, Janet Mills, down south of me. That's why I'm going like that. Uh, that witch, that horrible devil, walking devil, passing something like that. Late-term abortion. Baby's almost ready to come out. Oh, just abort it, you know. Disgusting. That blood cries out to God. Take those little dead bodies, take them out to a landfill and just dump them someplace. A medical waste, just back it in there, dump it. Oh, it smells bad. Little bodies of babies. Well, yes, brother, but, you know, the wrath of God is coming to America and, and um, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble there and, and we, we have to go through it. The body of Christ needs to be purified. Are you mad? Are you insane? Do you realize how bad it's going to be? Do you realize how angry God is? Down there? You know, and I, I can't prove this. This is just a theory. But what if every time a volcano goes off, what if that's the earth, hell growing, has to push more of that molten liquid out? I don't know. Bible doesn't say it. Science certainly wouldn't say that. But, you know, I've thought about that different times. I know my son said that the one time. He said, is that hell enlarging itself, Father? Pushing out that lava? Could be. I don't know. But hell better make some real big room down there. Lord needs to expand hell. Um, go to Numbers. Uh, because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be moving into hell soon. Lots of people. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. A whole nation. Hundreds of millions of people. You go over there to China... Over a billion people. How many are saved? That's a lot of people going to hell. Number 16. And do the same for India and any of the other big countries out there. The BRICS nations and things that rejected the Bible and don't want anything, anything to do with the Lord. Most of those are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. The kings of the east, you know. But uh, America, I think, is going to get most of its punishment beforehand. And if judgment comes, it must begin at the house of God. So the Christians in this country, they have some rough times coming. Maybe the Lord's going to allow this trad cat to get in there. And maybe he'll come out and he'll say, going to start putting heretics to death. Numbers 16, verse 23 through 34. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. 
And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. On every side, and Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby <clears throat> ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own hand. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and then they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand these that these men have provoked the Lord. The pit, hell, under their feet. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> and it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, that, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Well, if the earth is flat, brethren, you realize that they had to be standing over the exact location of the heart of the earth? You get a flat disk. Flat disk. You have to be right in the center in order for that to work. But if you have a globe, you can be anywhere. You're right above hell, wherever you want to be. It's right under your feet, wherever you're at. Well, the Bible absolutely proves a flat earth. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Okay, Numbers 26. Numbers 26, verses 9 through 10. And the sons of Eliab, Nemuel, and Dathan, and Abiram, this is, what, this is that Dathan and Abiram, which were famous in the congregation who strove against Moses and against Aaron in the company of Korah, when they strove against the Lord. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. When, they, when that company died, what time the fire, fire, devoured 250 men and they became a sign notwithstanding the children of Korah died not okay um, so notice two things there the op earth opened her mouth it says there verse 10 the earth opened her, uh, her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah with the, when that company died what time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign the earth opens its mouth and there's fire inside of it. Like I said, if you believe in the flat earth, then you have to believe that they were at the exact place and somehow it's flat and the earth kind of goes, you know, or something like this and, and the fire's right down underneath there. But had they run over this way, they could have gotten away or run over that way, they could have gotten away. No, it's a sphere. That's why you could be anywhere at all on the earth. And hell can be directly below you. Revelation chapter 12. Now here's an interesting one. Revelation chapter 12. Uh, verse 12 through 17. Devil gets kicked out of heaven here. If you don't know the story, you can read the whole chapter if you want to. But it says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cut or that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nursed for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. I believe that's three and a half years. Um, and look at verse 15. 
And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Different salvation set up than what we have today, because you're in the time of Jacob's trouble, and he's dealing with the remnant, the seed of Israel there. Today, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3. There is no difference between a Jew and a Gentile Christian. We're both in Christ, you see. But in that time, you have the Jews come back. They're keeping the commandments of Jesus, and, or the commandments of God, and the testimony of Jesus there, Jesus Christ. Very important. But you say, okay, the, the serpent, the devil there, he opens his mouth and water comes out. And the earth opens up its mouth and swallows this flood of water. That's fairly simple to understand. Well, here's what the real truth is, though. It isn't water the way that you would think of it as liquid, okay? I'm going to show you what the water really is. Very interesting here. Go to Revelation chapter 17. Uh, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Waters there. Jump over to, uh, where is it here? Verse 15 of the same chapter. Revelation 17, verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So those waters there, that Mystery Babylon, she sits upon those waters. She controls these people, these nations out there. Hmm. And the devil is going to control those people. He's going to tell them, he's going to give them a command, and they're going to go out to try to get the remnant of the seed of Israel. I'll give you some more scriptures to back this up. Some interesting stuff. Jeremiah chapter 46 Jeremiah chapter 46, um, verse 7 through 10. It says here, Who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Flood and waters again, remember? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up, Egypt, and will cover the earth. I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Come up, ye horses, and rage, ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield, and the Libyan, and the Lydians excuse me, that handle and bend the bow. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. For the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Hmm. Um... There's a few interesting things there. Let's read that verse again, verse 10. For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts. The day of the Lord gets started there. A day of vengeance. He takes, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Um, Mystery Babylon comes into his mind to pour unto them, to, uh, to Mystery Babylon, the cup of his indignation and wrath. The book of Revelation, chapter 16. That he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour... And it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. A sword comes out of his mouth in Revelation 19, and he slays the 200 million man army. Hmm, very interesting. So you have that, but I believe even before that, there's the thing of the earth actually helps the woman, opens up its mouth, opens up her mouth, and this flood of waters, these huge army that's coming, some of those people go down into hell. I mean, I don't have it all worked out. I mean, ultimately, you get into the book of Revelation. It's pretty much for the Lord to unseal that book. But you can see how some of these scriptures tie together. And it's tied into, The Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Hmm. The river Euphrates. Uh, Jerem, or Revelation 16. Go back to Revelation 16. We'll see about this thing of the river Euphrates.
Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Huh, they march up through that dry river. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, uh, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Okay. Um, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. So, very interesting there. Um, the thing of the devil sending in troops there, they're likened to a flood of water, and it's the water that upon which the woman sitteth, the Roman Catholic legions, in other words, uh, legions of Rome, iron legions of Rome, iron mixed with miry clay, the fifth kingdom. And they go out to destroy Israel, the remnant of the nation of Israel. Very interesting indeed. Um, and it's funny because there are the devil's spirits come out of the dragon's mouth. The spirits, they look like frogs. Um, the devil pours out this flood out of his mouth. There's a lot of tie-in stuff there. Um, Amos chapter 8. Go back to the Old Testament now, to the book of Amos chapter 8. Verses 7 through 9. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up wholly as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Uh... Yeah, okay. Uh, you say, well, see, he causes the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Um, well, then that proves geocentricity. Well, no, I don't know. I mean, you can, again, you can argue it. If you really want to waste time, you can argue it. Go back and forth and start throwing out the name heretic, and if you don't believe the way I do about the shape of the earth, well, let's fight about it. Let's, let's go kill each other while the Vatican's over here coming to power, and while they're destroying our financial system, and they're destroying our health saying that they're going to need to do more things in the future, you know, if you know what I'm saying. And we're fighting about the shape of the earth. You know, some brother comes along and says, hey, I mean, flat earth, there's no excuse for it. It's ridiculous. Um, I have no time for that stuff. It's wicked. It's satanic. And I'll keep saying that. The geocentricity thing yeah, you can make some arguments for it. You know, you can go back and forth on that. And you, but you start getting into the whole thing of, well, you have to look at the way that the stars align and the way that, you know, are we rotating or are they rotating or is this rotating or is that rotating? And what about this? What uh, the, you know, if there's nothing else to do, then yes, let's sit around and talk about the shape of the earth and whether it moves. You know, well, the shape of the earth is a, is a globe. But what I'm saying is whether it moves or it's stationary or whatever. If we have nothing else to do, fine. All right. But brethren, there's more stuff to do. There's a lot more to do. And so, you know, I had to say something about it because it's just been years that I've been letting it go and it's building and it's turning into this huge cancerous, cancerous type of growth that's infecting the body of Christ. Isaiah 14. Go back to Isaiah 14. We'll hit a few more places here and then we'll be done with this study. Isaiah 14. Verse 9 through 15. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become a weak become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave in the noise of thy vials. 
the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. That's a nice thought. You have Herod in the New Testament, and they, he's given this mighty oration, and they, they say, it's not the voice of a man, it's the voice of, of you know, God, or whatever, voice of a God. And, and he falls down and you know, dies, and the worms come up and eat him and things. That's a picture of a man in hell. You like that? It's a good place to go. Going to party down in hell, yeah, with worms covering you. Terrible. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Revelation chapter 12. Cast down to the earth. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Hmm. Hell is likened to a pit. We read about that earlier. The pit that's down there. You don't say a pit is sort of a sideways chamber or a whatever or some floaty thing in the air. Or, you know, I have to just put stuff out there because people probably come up with something. You know, I don't know of any flat earther that's ever flat earther that's ever said that the hell is a floaty you know thing above the earth, but there could be some that do. You never know. But uh, hell is down and it's likened to a pit. There's an important reason for that. Uh, Ezekiel 31. Go to Ezekiel chapter 31. I'll show you some more interesting things here. The Bible's a very interesting book, isn't it? Ezekiel 31, um, verse 15 through 17. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning, I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, when I cast him down to hell, again down there, with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be com comforted in, in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Well, I can explain exactly what that is. You cannot. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there. There's, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. You just read it and you say, well, I don't really know what that means. It kind of gives me some interesting thoughts or images in my mind, but I have no idea what that means. If I had to draw all that out. But I know one thing. Hell is down. And it's associated with a pit. You know where I'm going with this probably. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Um, uh, verse 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. Hmm. And a great chain in his hand. And he laid hand and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up. Into the earth opens her mouth. Down into hell, to the sides of the pit. Thou shalt be cast down to hell, the sides of the pit. You see? Uh, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. All right. Now, here's my theory. Okay. And it is a theory. I cannot teach this dogmatically, but I think that this makes sense to me, logically speaking. The location of hell from the King James Bible, it's in the heart of the earth. It only makes sense if it's in a sphere in a ball, okay? A flat plane does not have a heart. Uh, it's very important to understand that. A sphere can have a heart in the center of the earth that anybody on earth can say it's down below me, okay? There's gravity there. Yes, I believe in gravity. You know, you drop the ball, it goes down. Um, and anybody, hell is right beneath them. 
just like the Bible teaches. So someplace, somewhere, the Lord, where he's at there in Revelation chapter 20, he can open up the mouth of the earth like that, like this, and there's a bottomless pit. Then go right down into that center, down into hell there. I mean, Isaiah chapter 14 said he brought down to hell to the size of the pit. He goes down there like that. Now, this is just a theory. Don't call me a heretic. I'm just posing a theory. If the earth is rotating like this, what if the devil's down there and as he gets down towards the center like this, the earth rotates and now he's no longer falling down. Now he starts to fall the opposite direction or something. I don't know. How long would it take to get to the, the heart of the earth? What if it's just constantly the bottomless pit is because he's going up and down inside it as it spins? You know, they have this experiment there to take a, a pail of water and they, if you spin it quick enough, you can go upside down like that. Remember that in science class? And they go upside down like that and the water wouldn't spill out because it's moving fast enough. All right. There's a, probably a fancy term for that. I don't really care to study that stuff. So, but you know what I mean? If you know what it is, you know, well, good for you. But what if that's the way it is? Just a theory. The devil gets dropped down in and he's falling down in there and then he turns, it turns and he's now no longer falling and he starts falling that down that way and it turns again and he's falling this way and that way and this way and that way as it's spinning. Bottomless pit. 1,000 years. Like this. And whoa, 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 whoa. I think that would tend to make him a little bit mad. Just a theory. Just to say that one more time. I'm not teaching that doctrinally. Don't get excited. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, um, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Okay, four quarters of the earth. Well, this is two. The you know we'll say it this way, because the purple's colder. You know, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, and then you could cut it in half this way and this way, and have two other ones. So you would have four quarters of the earth. Makes sense to me. Verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. You go up on the breadth of a hill, the breadth of a city. It doesn't mean the width of a flat disc or something like that. Um, encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's going to be fun to see that. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the important thing, brethren. Right there. We have a ministry. We're supposed to sow seeds to people that have never heard. What are seeds to people that have heard? And God gives the increase. That's our whole purpose. Not to argue over the shape of the earth and whether the earth moves and whatever else. You can, you're free to have whatever beliefs you want. But if you're coming over here to try to hinder the gospel and you're saying things. I mean, I've looked at some of the comments and it's just insanity. Brian Denlinger has an upside down cross here. Dear sister and Lord made this nice little thing here. It says Jesus on it. And this is an upside down cross here. I wonder why. Oh, 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 the conspiracy gets deeper. Yeah, into insanity in your mind. It's not a cross. It's not an upside down cross. There's a little thing that comes over there. Okay? Um, you have to be very dishonest to say, oh, look, he's got an upside down cross. But that's the way the flat earth thing goes. <coughs> Excuse me. 
another person I saw in the comments and they said um, that uh, Brian Denlinger, he, he held up the book, you know, the flat earth book and he held it over his eye like this on purpose. You know, he's give, he's signaling to the Illuminati or something uh, because he covered his, his eye. No, actually it's because I have a, the viewfinders right here on the side of my camera. And if I'm going to hold this up, I need to make sure I have it as close as possible, but I can't, if I do this, I don't know if I have it focused. So I have to be able to see with one eye and have this over like this. There's no Illuminati conspiracy. I don't work for NASA. I'm not a Jesuit priest or a secret papist or, you know, whatever. I mean, I realize to some of them, they're just atheists that are out there trying to sow division. I get that. But I've seen some very gullible people and they fall for this flat earth thing. And all of a sudden, all the pilots are involved and, and oh, all the people that ever study astronomy and, and people that have telescopes, they're involved too. And oh, it's this huge conspiracy. I'm not against conspiracies, brethren. Okay, I teach a lot about conspiracy, more than most preachers do, right? I'm not bragging, I'm just stating a fact. I'm not against conspiracies. But what I'm against is going into the wrong conspiracies and the wrong arguments, you know, um, profane and vain babblings, the Bible says, or to avoid that stuff. And when I see it and it's this twisting of scripture and, well, shall not be moved means the earth is stationary. No, it, it's an English idiom. Okay, I did a whole study on that. It doesn't mean that it doesn't move. And the Bible says it moves exceedingly elsewhere, right? And you say, what's well, an earthquake? It just, you know, it moves this way. You know, if it's flat or something or whatever, it, uh, it's still moving. So you cause a contradiction in the scriptures. If you say it doesn't move and yet it moves. Uh, no, it's two different things. It's two different statements there. Um, and I've seen all these other arguments too. You know, uh, this, what's some of the others? Oh, another good one. Um, that uh, the devil takes Jesus up to a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. They always miss that part. And, and you know, how could that happen if the earth is round? If it's a sphere? Um there's no mountain right now that you can climb up to the top of and see all the kingdoms of the world. Okay, it's talking about something that happens supernaturally in a moment of time. The devil's able to show the Lord. You say, how? I don't know. I wasn't there. Well, the Lord caused the sun to stand still. So that proves that we have geocentricity. No, it proves that the Lord caused the sun to stand still because Joshua prayed it. Joshua was seeing it. He perceived it, that the sun stands, stood still. It could be that the earth stopped rotating. The Lord has the power to do that. Another good one that the flat earthers will come up with, they'll say, well, good one, it's a bad one. They'll say, well, you know, um, every eye shall see Jesus when he comes back. So if you have a globe earth, you know, David Hoffman said this, and I'm not quoting verbatim, okay? I don't care to. Um, but it's, if you have a globe earth, then how could every eye see Jesus, you know, when he comes back? Hmm, got you there. Uh, so you're limiting God now? Uh, the Lord could be, he could easily appear to everybody, globe earth or not. So this twisting of scripture, this contortion of it and whatever, and then just, oh, you're lost if you disagree with me. Uh, I have a problem with that, right? The knowledge that's from above is pure, it's peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits and things. Like I talked about in my other study, James chapter three, it has to pass that test. But when you have something that's earthly, sensual, and devilish, you have to attack that back. You see? A real teaching of Scripture is come, it will come and it will be very peaceable. It's beautiful. You know? But something that's of the devil comes along and it comes in angry and it comes in with lots of animosity and whatever else. And people said, oh, Brian, the, the Bible version issue, the King James only movement, it's, there's lots of strife and contention. Uh, no, actually, there isn't. There isn't. You see, I can tell people this beautiful, wonderful, blessed book right here, this will lead you into all truth. God's word is pure. You can trust it. I've lived my life by this King James Bible. It's wonderful. The vast majority of the extant Greek manuscripts line up with the Receptus, which this is the best translation of it, in my opinion. Um, you can argue that, whatever else. But I can see it's pure. It's peaceable. But the New Version people come along with their satanic Alexandrian corruptions, and they attack this blessed book, and then I attack, attack back. That's where the strife and contention comes in because they're attacking with their satanic, earthly, sensual, devilish wickedness. You see what I'm saying? 
I could sit somebody, some person comes in off the street, says, tell me what the Bible says. Tell me about the Word of God. Everything that I can show them from the Scriptures would be pure and peaceable and lovely. But if I'm sitting there with that lost person, I'm going through the Scriptures and showing them, and all of a sudden some Roman Catholic comes walking by and they say, you need to be part of Christ's true church. You need to you know, go to auricular confession and you need to confess your sins to the priest and be confirmed and whatever. Well, I can't go... Uh, okay, you know, well, we all have our differences and of opinions, and I can't say anything against. I say, you wicked devil, you Roman Catholic, how dare you bring your satanic heresies here and try to corrupt this person that actually wants to get to know the Lord? You see? Well, you're being contentious. I have to be, I have to fight with this person, this heretic that's coming along. Jesus did it, Paul did it, all of them did it. That's what it has to be. So, this, but the whole thing is this flat earth thing comes in and it's nasty from the beginning. So, you know, and I don't attack people uh, over a lot of different issues. And again, that's been another big lie about me. Well, Brian, you judge people's salvation if they're Trinitarian. No, I judge people if they're Trinitarian and they have no desire for repentance. There's no turning from it and they're just attacking the Godhead doctrine of the scriptures. Then I'll start to say, oh, I don't know. I, I don't think it took with you. But there's a lot of people out there that believe in the Trinity that have never heard about the Godhead doctrine. But if you would say to them, do you believe that you get up to heaven and there's three different persons up there, each with its own unique, you know, God, God title, they'd say, no, I don't believe that. I believe Jesus is God. Yeah, that's the Godhead doctrine. So, um, you know, I don't know. The Lord, it, my life is dictated by what the Lord says for me to do. Um, not that I always listen to him. Sometimes I'm a little bit thick-headed and he has to, you know, chasten me and whatever else to get me to do certain things. But uh, I pray about things. And if the Lord says, okay, there's an area you didn't cover with this flat earth thing. There's still some brethren out there that are a little bit hurt by what you've been saying and you should say it differently or go to them in this way. And what? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. I'll do that. Yes, sir. Uh, he's my commanding officer. You aren't. Okay. Not one of you out there commands me and tells me what to do before him. You can give me suggestions. You can correct me in love as a brother and treat me as a father, as the Bible talks about, an elder that ruleth well, you know, and treat him as a father. Again, you know, some of the attacks that it come from these little Gen Zers or whatever, the little Antichrist generation, and they think that they can just come, come and attack and be very disrespectful to a man that's been in ministry, some of them probably longer than they've been alive. You know, arrogant little punks. Uh, it's not supposed to be that way. You come and you say, hey, uh, brother, I have some, you know, things here and some things there and whatever. So, um, brethren, there's a lot more important things out there than this. Then why'd you do a study on it? Because I had to. Okay. Uh, I let it go for years. And unfortunately, you know, they say about nip it in the bud is the old saying. What does that mean? If uh, you see some kind of a noxious weed growing and you nip it in the bud, you take your your uh, clippers or whatever, and you go over and go, and you cut it off where it's going to blossom, get that thing before it puts out seed and before it has a chance to reproduce. Well, I didn't nip this problem in the bud. I didn't. And the flat earth thing got bigger and bigger, and now it's messing up lots of people. A lot of people that have been very, very well-meaning, they're getting sucked into this thing. They get confused by the twisting of scripture. Um, the King James Bible does not teach that the earth is flat. No, it doesn't. You say, what about the stretching out of the heavens and things like that? Um, if you think that the heavens are totally and completely over the earth and there's nothing beyond the earth and whatever, uh, no. Okay, the heavens are a lot bigger than that. And if the earth was just stretched out over the earth alone, um, you'd have all kinds of problems. I mean, you make so many problems. If you put the sun and the moon and they're going wee, wee, wee around the earth, I mean, What's keeping them there? What keeps them from banging into the ice walls and things? So um, I'm shutting off the comments on the all the flat earth stuff because of all the contention from these wicked people that are coming along. I realize that there are people that believe geocentricity or whatever. You're more respectable. I'm not lumping you in with all the rest of the cultic, you know, heretic people. I'm not. But what I'm saying is be more open-minded to some of this stuff. Um, how many of us really know if the thing's spinning and what? I don't know. There's a lot more important things I need to do uh, than argue over this. 
And if you want to write off this ministry and say, I'm not giving to the ministry anymore and I refuse, then stop watching me, okay? See, I'm probably going to do a video on this in the future, but let me just explain something because I don't talk about the thing of tithing and whatever else. Tithing is not a New Testament practice in terms of giving 10% of your income. You will not find that teaching in the New Testament. That's there to pay off mortgages of church buildings. Let's just be straight about that. But the Bible does teach that you are to, uh, if you see a ministry that's doing good, you should give to that ministry so that you, that when there's fruit that is born of that ministry, you can receive some of that back. If you understand the stock market, there's a company they sell shares in their company. You can own part of this company. Invest your money into this, and then when we do good, we will give you dividends because you own stocks, also, you know, shares of this company. All right? People make money that way. There's a lot of people that that's all that they do. They just buy and sell in the stock market. Um, they get really into that whole thing, and they're, they're looking for a good company. Well, that's what you do as a Christian. You look for a good ministry, and you say, Boy, I wish I could put out the kind of material that, that uh, Brian Denlinger puts out. King James Video Ministries, they put out some really great sermons. Boy, there's people that have uh, gotten saved and their lives changed and everything. Hmm. Boy, I wish I could have some of that reward when I get to heaven. I wish I could be a partaker with him in that. You can by helping the ministry continue. That's the purpose of giving. No man at worth, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of another, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Okay. Um, who goeth a wharf any, wharf? Excuse me, let me slow down. <laughs> Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? If I have to go into battle, then people out there should pay for my uniform and my weapons and whatever because I'm there to defend your freedom. I'm there to fight for you. Well, I go to war with the lost world out there. And I've done my very best over the years to try to get out information and put it out there for free for people. If you see that, understand this ministry is not monetized. All right. If you've been blessed, you want part of the rewards that will come to this ministry, give to the ministry. All right. But it just, it angers me when I see people and they say, Denlinger's a heretic and whatever, and then they still obsessively watch me. I think, what is the point of that? So those are the people I'm kicking. And, and thank you to all those out there that do support this ministry. Praise the Lord for that. I will be talking about the fruits of the ministry in the future. Um, there's a lot of fruits of this ministry. It blows my mind sometimes the kind of people that have contacted us over the years. Um, tens of thousands of people. How many people got saved? The Lord knows. I have no idea. I really don't. But uh, to those who have supported the ministry, thank you. Um, please do continue to support us. Um, please, brethren, uh, this flat earth thing, fight on some level, yes, I get it. You have to do something. Don't just let them come in and take over conversations and, and just try to draw people away. You have to fight them, uh, just like the Lord fought the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. That has to be there. But don't get so drawn into this thing that you're spending all your time trying to learn about uh, astronomy and geography and all the other things and how to disprove the flat earth. It's a psyop, all right? That's what it is. Um, intelligent people don't believe this thing. Oh, you're saying we're stupid. I'm saying you're deceived. Okay? You believe in the flat earth thing, you've been deceived. The Bible does not teach it. All right? So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Get busy for the Lord. Seriously. I mean, hate me. Call, my, call me names. Make videos against me on your channel. Denlinger's in a globe tard, whatever. Do whatever you want. But get busy for the Lord, okay? Go with the plain teachings of the King James Bible. Go with the scriptures. Hell is directly underneath your feet. That's where it is. I heard the one time the one guy said to some preacher, one of the many thousands of sermons I've listened to over my life, and he said, the thickest part of the earth's crust, I don't know whether this is true or not, is, is about 20, 20 miles thick. He said, in other words, hell is 20 miles or less away from every man, woman, and child on this planet. Now, that's true. That's a thought. We drive a lot of times farther than 20 miles. And that's the distance straight down. Walking around above hell. I want to go up. And I want to take other people with me. That's what matters, brethren. 
not the shape of the earth. Thank you for watching.